head pastor is a fundamental figure within the church who is met with praise, accolades, and reliance upon to dispel the word of God to the masses. He is most often on the top of the hierarchical ladder or status as the main focal figure to render out theological interpretations within the church institution. He or she is often trained and graduated as a professional from a seminary who has met the criteria or qualifications to maintain their position. What would happen if the office of the head pastor was removed from the church altogether? Could the church still function, or would it completely dissolve without a prominent figure to man the helm? What may come as a surprise is that the pastoral function among the early church looks quite different to the office of the head pastor in the modern churches today. The facts of history and scriptural context will serve as evidence that this is the truth. It is important to leave your personal feelings at the door because many will have many friends and family who fill the head pastoral office somewhere. This is not meant as an attack on them as individuals, but a critical examination of the office of the head pastor. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. From the only singular verse that appears in the New Testament, there are some important things to consider. The word pastor is used in plural form. This means that there is no scriptural evidence that there was a singular, senior, head, pastoral practice among the early church. A pastor is a shepherd. This would mean that a pastor is not a professional title, but a metaphor for one of the many functions of the church. A shepherd is a person who cares for and nurtures the people of God, but not within the context of a professional hierarchical title. Upon closer inspection of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, it appears that man has added to and distorted the true definition, description, and function of a pastor, which has created the office of the head pastor in the institutionalized churches today. The man-made idea of a prominent head pastor comes from a desire of people to have someone revered to bring them to God who is specially trained and is to stand out from others within the church. Numbers chapter 11 verses 26 through 29. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man, and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? These verses give an example of Moses opposing hierarchical or special positions that would suppress all of God's people from using their giftings to the specially qualified. 3 John verses 9 and 10. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Revelation chapter 2 verse 6 says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. These are the words of Jesus Christ, who was opposed to Nicolaitans, which means conquering the people. He was opposed to making distinct hierarchical classes of people among the church who are considered prominent by lording themselves over others. The definition of the pastoral office in our Western society is not a biblical concept, but a man-made one that is a distortion of a gifting. The early church were led solely by the headship of Jesus Christ, where his body was recognized by men who were of all equal standing, 
people were recognized by their spiritual maturity, not by their hierarchical elitism. The apostles did not reside as permanent fixtures, but were temporal as church planters who moved where God called them to oversee for a time. The deviation from the biblical pastoral office can be traced to Ignatius of Antioch and his distortion of the role of the bishop. According to him, the bishop was given complete authority and required absolute obedience in the church system. In the third century, Scipion of Carthage made more distinct classifications of Christians with the terms clergy and laity. He was a pagan orator who became a Christian who did not abandon the pagan traditions but incorporated them. The distorted position of bishop eventually evolved into the head of the church and the delegated responsibilities went to the presbyter. The presbyter evolved into the Catholic priest as the hierarchical structure of the church broadened. By the fourth century, deacons took a role under the presbyters and under them were the laymen. By the time of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, the Catholic church practices were questioned. The bishop's office and the priesthood was reduced to the presbyter. What the Protestants did not do was question the status classifications between clergy and laity, but kept them with their own classification system. These are those who are special, called, and who must be ordained into a ministry. In fact, there is really no distinction between the duties of the Catholic priest and a Protestant pastor, except for a slightly reformed office. The early church were a participatory body. But the church system requires a ruling single pastor, sola pastora. Likewise, the bishop was raised to a status where all power and authority from him was absolute. Ignatius said, he that honors the bishop is honored of God. Fallen man always has the urge for someone to mediate between them and God. We can see this in Exodus when the Israelites wanted Moses to be their mediator for everything. Today we can see that the pastor takes on a similar role and conducts everything from baptism, marriages, sermons, and controlling influence over other activities within the institutional church. The hierarchical system infiltrated the church as a result of the influential Greco-Roman culture. The church had become an institution with official people doing ministry. The true scriptural church, which was led by the Holy Spirit, was functional and shared by all believers, but soon became a thing of the past. Pagan organizational patterns have infiltrated and become the backbone of what is the modern institutional church. A true follower of Jesus Christ should understand that what a person does in everyday life is sanctified by God. There is no need for a higher calling into the ministry versus a worldly vocation. The dichotomy between what is sacred and what is worldly is a pagan conception. There are no grounds for ordained spiritual elitism because every believer has the discernment from God to recognize those who have particular giftings that God has given them. Among the early church, the term ordain did not mean to be put into an official title, but rather an affirmation of the gifting and character of an individual that is recognized. It was a blessing pertaining to the function, not a right. Ordination into office stems from pagan rites by empowering an individual through divine streams to become venerable, honorable, and separated. It is the syncretism of Old Testament priesthood with Greek hierarchy. In contrast, each person who was part of the early church did not set themselves higher than one another, but in humility served each other. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 2 and 3 say, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. You will find nowhere in the New Testament where preaching, baptizing, marriage, etc. 
was limited to those with special powers and authority. We all have immediate access to God. The true church are a collective of believers that share the word of God with one another, not via a singular paid mediator to a passive audience. According to John Calvin, the pastoral office is necessary to preserve the church on earth in a greater way than the sun, food, and drink are necessary to nourish and sustain the present life. It is clear today that most church institutions have taken John Calvin's model of church, but is in no way, shape, or form the model of the early church which apostles had planted. Both the Catholic and Protestant practices of church are built on the same human ideologies and traditions. The modern pastoral office has become an obstacle to the true functioning of the church. True functioning believers of Jesus Christ are not meant to be simply ears to hear the very words of God that are spewed from the pulpit every Sunday morning. Minister means servant. It has become incorrectly synonymous with a pastor who is in a professionalized salaried position. What has the office of the head pastor of the modern church done to followers of Jesus Christ that can be seen in the modern churches today? What really stands out is the division of Christians into separate classes where the special or more privileged can only serve Jesus Christ in certain ways. The man-made system suffocates the rest of the people into becoming complacent to a one-man ministry that reaches to a mute audience. In contrast, the early church encouraged every member of the body of Christ to function with a right and privilege in the church assembly. Are you sick and tired of being a spectator who feels coerced and obligated to sing, raise your hands, take notes, and throw money in the throats of the offering plate? Unfortunately, the office of the head pastor in the modern church has circumvented the very headship of Jesus Christ because it has taken the centrality and the functional headship away from other believers. When Jesus Christ is truly the headship, it manifests as freedom and openness with everyone contributing and all body parts functioning as they should. The professional modern pastor has become slave to the office which oppressively manifests in many ways, such as emotional breakdown, marital issues, stress, plastic fantastic, burnout, and depression, just to name a few. This is not the result of the pastor, but the effect of the modern office. Scripture does not support one sole individual to wear so many hats at one time. There is a high expectation and obligation to entertain, tickle ears, and make everyone feel good. This is artificial Christianity at its best, which is to be blunt, is dishonest and deceptive. The modern head pastor can be likened to a Hollywood star who wins an Oscar for the primary role as portraying someone who is always spiritual, cheerful, perfectly dressed, and disciplined in all areas of life. The unapproachable and unquestioning attitude exposes the corrupt and political nature of the modern office, which often leads to isolation from being among the people, or laity, to just those who are over the people, the clergy, within the institutional church system. They often have no real substance outside of that group. The evidence reveals that the office of the head pastor by how it functions in the modern church is unsupported and non-existent in scripture. Amen. Thank you and God bless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain.
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. through 4. This is the Gospel, the Gospel of the grace of God, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, took, him, took on Himself the nature of a man, he was crucified and died for our sins, and He rose again on the third day. I to ask you the most important question of your life. Your joy or sorrow for all eternity depends on your answer to this question. Are you saved? This has nothing to do with how good you are or if you go to a building called a church, but are you born again? In John chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus said, Ye must be born again. How can you be born again? First of all, you must realize that you are a sinner. Sin is anything in us that does not express or is contrary to the holy nature of our Creator, God. For instance, have you ever lied or cheated or stolen? These are all contrary to the character of God. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 when it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because you are a sinner, you are condemned to death. For the wages or the payment of sin is death. We read that in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. This includes eternal separation from God in hell. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. But God loved you so much He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, to bear your sin and die in your place. He hath made Him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Jesus had to shed His blood and die. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Although we cannot understand how, God said, My sins and your sins were laid upon Jesus, and He died in our place. He became our substitute. It is true, God cannot lie. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, to repent means to turn around, to confess and forsake one's sins. It's a change of mind and a change of heart and a change of attitude that abhors sins. It agrees with God that one is a sinner and also agrees that Jesus died for us on the cross. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simply believe on Him as the one who bore your sin, died in your place, was buried, and whom God resurrected. His resurrection powerfully assures that the believer can claim everlasting life when Jesus is received as Savior. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. John chapter 1 verse 12 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 Whosoever includes you shall be saved means not maybe nor can, but shall be saved. If you would like to learn more about sin, salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, or anything else concerning the Christian faith, please visit www.acceptyoubeconverted.com. Acceptyoubeconverted.com is an anti-church system, Trinitarian, free will, eternal security, King James Only, Christian Zionist, Young Earth Creation, Lordship Salvation Ministry, where you can learn sound doctrine, apologetics, hermeneutics, and more. AcceptYouBeConverted.com is mobile friendly and secure from hackers and malware with SiteLock. Are you looking for fellowship? AcceptYouBeConverted.com is a virtual community with daily visits from men and women around the globe. 
Each page includes a comment section. There is a live chat feature that is available in the desktop and mobile version where you can chat with anyone on the site at any time. Join the fun on the message board, which you can access by clicking on the link on the footer or by going to acceptyoubeconverted.proboards.com. AcceptYouBeConverted.com offers MP3 Bible teaching through Sermon Audio, which you can access through the website or through SermonAudio.com or the Sermon Audio app. Just search for It Is Written KJV. If you would like to send me your prayer requests, questions, or comments, there is a contact form on the website, also my Facebook and Twitter. Feel free to contact me anytime. I would love to hear from you. Please visit today. Support the ministry. Share with your friends and family. Share on Gospel Tracks. Pray for the ministry. Become a partner and help spread the truth of God's Word far and wide. Introducing new video series for YouTube channel It Is Written KJV 1611. Bible Hermeneutics. Learn how to correctly interpret the Bible. Defending the Faith. Master apologetics and be prepared to answer any objections. KJV Bible Q&A, answering various questions with the Bible. Doctrines of Devils Refuted, refuting many false doctrines with Scripture. False Church System Exposed, exposing the many problems within the modern church system. Go Preach, all about spreading the Gospel. False Teachers Exposed, Bible teachers held accountable and named by name. KJV Defended, exposing corrupt modern Bible versions and teaching all things concerning the King James Bible. And more. Please subscribe and share.